Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this, the 68th class in our series on the Abrahamic religions, now <clears throat> focusing, of course, on the Baha'i faith. We should have at least uh, five or six more classes um, as we go through the uh, both the teachings and the um, institutions of the faith uh, as they evolve. <clears throat> Before we, uh, I don't think we're going to go into all of the writings of uh, uh, Abdul Baha or Shoghi Effendi, though I'll do something with that, but not as in depth as, as we have gone over the writings of Baha'u'llah. And of course, we've hardly touched on all of the writings of Baha'u'llah, but we're doing a decent survey of sort of what I call the shape of his revelation because. It's very valuable to look at his revelation as uh, one whole work revealed in successive stages that are discernible, that is, the framework of it is discernible. Uh, so we're now at sort of a stage that is uh, uh, before the last stage, which would be the summing up that you get with the epistle to the son, of the son of the wolf, and then the tablet of Carmel and the tablet of my covenant, which sort of close out his uh, re revealed works. So these works we're revealing now are, of course, in the book called The Tablets of Baha'u'llah Revealed After the Kitab i Agdas. And I've divided them into two sorts of um, uh, categories. The one tonight, which I call in my book, the um, uh, Ocean of His Words, Gnomic Verse, which means a, a collection of, usually it goes back to Greek genre, where it's a collection of sayings. And you have this in the Bible. Uh, with a, a collection of uh, uh, truisms, uh, spiritual verities, uh, and they are common to every tribal culture that you have sort of a, a numbering of a list of what constitutes refined or good behavior. In fact, that's one of the talks we're going to have later is, is the doctrine of refinement or uh, and we'll uh, uh, talk about how this is sort of an overriding theme uh, in the Kitab i Agdas. Um, first, uh, since we have some people uh, who've joined us uh, since, uh, well, lots of people since we first began the series, one thing I wanted to show you before I begin the presentation on the works that we're going to look at tonight I'm going to share my screen, and Alex, if you would keep an eye out for there's someone else who needs admitting, would you take care of that? Got it. Um, the, uh, I want to show you, uh, when you go in, this is the talk I gave last week, and of course you skip over the ad and you'll enlarge it like so and, and hear me give my talk, but uh, one thing that you may not notice, those of you who are new, is that also included uh, on the uh, website or the uh, YouTube channel, you get this, you go to the same place, you'll see here the slides, this, this hot link or this hyperlink here below the title. And if you click on that, uh, it takes you to the uh, slides that are part of the, that are the presentation. So this is last week's presentation in the slide form. And you not only can look at them again, if you want to follow the program, of course, you'll see them. But one thing you can do that you may find useful is you see this little arrow up here, you can click it and you can download the, the uh, slides if you want to, uh, as a PDF file, all right? So, uh, let's uh, close that out and uh, let me go to our presentation for tonight. Um, let's see, we'll go here and 
we'll begin. Now, um, am I uh, sharing the screen properly, Alex? We see uh, the outline here. You might need to reshare. Okay, thank you. All right, let me stop sharing and reshare and go to the title now. Can you see it? We're good. Okay, thank you. Um, you've got uh, uh, in the class tonight seven different works we're going to look at, but all of them are in the form of what I say I call this gnomic verses, which is uh, tablets that are a collection of Baha'u'llah's um, reiteration of some particular laws uh, and ordinances and exhortations from the mother book, as the Kitabi Agdas is called. Now, why is it called the mother book? Uh, the same reason that the uh, Bayan of the Bab is called the mother book of that dispensation. The mother book is the most important work in a dispensation. Uh, and so the book of laws is the most holy book or the mother book because it gives birth to, if you will, all of the rest of the guidance that will uh, come about during the dispensation of Baha'u'llah. Uh, so if you will, the, it gives birth to the dispensation because it contains how you put all the spiritual teachings into practical action. And so we're going to go over these lists. I've left out the parts of these tablets that are narrative discourses, some of which are very valuable. But we're going to look instead at what laws he repeats, how he groups them together, uh, and so on. So uh, I uh, will begin with the glad tidings. Uh, which is a translation of a uh, uh, term meaning good news, or of course the word gospel uh, is also a term for good news. Good spell, good news, good spell. Um, and so what are the particular tidings that he lists? So I've uh, numbered all of them in, in very succinct form. Uh, first is the banning of holy war, the banning of jihad, that the religion shall not be spread by the sword or by coercion, but by the sword of the tongue. This is a, a metaphor that Baha'u'llah uses frequently, unsheathe the sword of your tongue from the the sheath of self he talks about in one hidden word. In other words, don't be silent, uh, teach others about this good news. So you have the banning of jihad, consort with all peoples, uh, with people of all religions, uh, which is very important. Uh, and, and you might think, well, doesn't every religion teach that? And of course, every, every religion does not teach that. And some of them teach quite the contrary to that. Uh, but it doesn't simply mean for the purpose of teaching the faith, but so there will be uh, collaboration with all the peoples of the various religions. Remember, again, as I've said so many times, the symbolic architecture of the Baha'i houses of worship with nine co-equal doors leading to a central dome, which symbolizes that all of the past religions are paths to the same God. And so we naturally consort with those people who have their own path to God. If they uh, it, uh, are interested in the Baha'i faith, fine. If they're not, we are still all striving to accomplish the same goal, which is a peaceful world, a just world, uh, and uh, the caring of all the citizens of this global community. A universal auxiliary language, and this is something he emphasizes in several of these collections, uh, and of course emphasizes it in uh, a, a number of his tablets to the kings and rulers, how important this is. And of course, it's not just the language, but a universal language and script so that uh, everyone will 
And of course, it says auxiliary, meaning you learn this language in addition to your own. At first, that's how it will be. But eventually, Baha'u'llah explains that there will be one language throughout the, the, the world. Um, number four of the glad tidings, should a king arise to help the oppressed people, all must love and serve him. Interestingly, even though the Baha'i administrative order is uh, in the form of a republic, and so far as elected representatives and, uh, and then an elected body that uh, um, uh, governs the administrative order, uh, Baha'u'llah has great praise for kings and kingship. And every time he talks about or to a king, and this is something we're going to see in Epistle to the Son of the Wolf, every time he mentions the Shah, even though the Shah is directly responsible for the slaughter of 20,000 Baha'is and even the execution of the Bab and the imprisonment and exile of Baha'u'llah, he treats him with utmost courtesy and utmost respect and praises him every time he mentions his name. And this is not some clever ruse on the part of Baha'u'llah. He is um, demonstrating for us the behavior that we should exercise ourselves in our relations with our government and with our political leaders. Whether we think they're good or not, we should be dutiful and uh, reliable citizens. The Baha'is in Iran, who have been severely persecuted since the beginning of the faith and still are being, if you've read the most recent news, the persecution of Baha'is and imprisonment of Baha'is is uh, accelerating. So uh, Baha'u'llah praises kings and kingship, and, 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 uh, uh, which is very interesting uh, uh, in, in a number of ways, and we'll get to that uh, another time. So uh, in, in a more general uh, exhortation, he says, obedience to the government and the land where you abide, be good citizen. So we are to be obedient to the government, even if we don't agree with its laws, we abide by them. So we are law-abiding citizens. And if you'll remember, in many of the works we've looked at by Baha'u'llah, he talks to those uh, kings and rulers in particular in his letters to them and says, uh, examine us, and, he, and that he means both himself and his followers, and see if we have ever been the cause of, of uh, any sort of uh, attempt to overthrow the government or do anything disruptive and so forth. This is why it was so grievous to Baha'u'llah when those uh, seven individuals uh, uh, murdered the uh, uh, antichrist of, of the, the faith, even though he was a thoroughly evil person. It was the wrong thing to do. It was not only against the law, but it also was uh, violating this whole concept of establish yourself as honest, as reliable, as good citizens of the land where you live. And uh, uh, th this same thing occurred, of course, when the, the crazed Babi tried to take the life of, of the Shah, and it resulted in just horrendous persecution work towards the establishment of the lesser peace. Uh, and of course, the lesser peace is the uh, secular uh, governance that will be established when the world leaders uh, gather together and form a collective pact of collective security. Uh, and we've talked about that before. We'll talk about it some more. You have freedom to choose the clothing and the cut of your beard. Uh, in effect, there's no strict, and he's talking, of course, a lot of these are undoing previous laws, such as those of Islam, and so far as uh, the women having to wear veils and, and so on. But he's also talking about the, uh, there is no 
regimen about what you should wear or how you should dress. And you've got to remember again, as I've said, when we were talking about the Katabi Agdas, this is an administration and a set of laws that is not based on uh, a specific culture or derived from it. It's, it's meant to be uh, applicable to any culture in any land. Uh, and I've got within reason what he says, do not be the plaything of fools, uh, meaning uh, reasonable to don't, uh, 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 in your appearance, be reserved, be clean, the uh, epitome of cleanliness and refinement. Again, this word refinement appears over and over again. Uh, he repeats this exhortation and this uh, uh, abolishment of the law of Christianity about asceticism or the ascetic life. Monks and priests should abandon ascetic life. They may wed and they should help society. Now, again, these aren't Baha'u'llah's words. These are my summing up of the tidings he is giving. So he frees the uh, priests and monks from asceticism, uh, even though he's praised that the effort that they put forth in the past for setting an example of chastity and so forth. Uh, but he says, now is the time for you to participate in the construction of a community uh, and a society. And then nine, confession of sins is forbidden. And this, of course, is specifically abolishing the uh, uh, expiation of sins, the process of expiation of sins in the Catholic Church, <clears throat> where you are obliged to confess your sins to the priest, who will then assign you some penitence uh, uh, or some penitential course of action, and then your sins are forgiven. Um, and um, without going into the history of that process, suffice it to say, Baha'u'llah abolishes it completely, says it is not permitted for you to do this. He doesn't mean that you can't share something you've done wrong with your assembly when you're asking for assistance or with a, a counselor or something. He meant in a formal sense that your forgiveness comes from God. And he reveals at this point a specific prayer to pray for the forgiveness of sin. Of course, there are other prayers for that as well. The law prescribing the, the, the uh, destruction of books is abolished. And this is something that comes from several religions, particularly Islam, where books that were contrary to the faith were to be burned or destroyed. So he says this is not allowed. Uh, it is permissible to study. Just really go back on number 10 for a second. I remember uh, there uh, in the university uh, where I taught, there was a book by uh, an individual that was uh, denouncing the Baha'i faith. Um, I forget it, the name of it now. Um, but at any rate, uh, some of the people and some of the students in the Baha'i Club were thinking, should they check it out and just not return it? <laughs> and we discussed it and said, no, this is against what Baha'u'llah prescribes here. It is permissible to study sciences and arts. Now, you may think that is a strange thing to say. Why, why would anybody not want you to? But some religions are very constrictive about what you can and cannot read or study. Uh, and he's saying that study of both the science and the arts, these two aspects of human learning uh, is not only permissible, but encouraged. And then everyone should engage in some form of occupation and not be slothful. And, and of course, this goes hand in hand with his law that against begging, against uh, 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 both either begging yourselves or contributing to those who are begging because he says that it, it encourages uh, this sort of, uh, I mean, you hate to say slothful because that it seems to condemn people who through no fault of their own may not have any income and don't know anything else to do. 
but of course, hopefully society as ours does to uh, some degree, assist have uh, uh, organizations and institutions to help those who are in need. But he forbids begging and he forbids you to contribute to begging if you are a Baha'i. Obey the house of justice. Do not curse, revile others. Guard your eyes from unseemliness. Be not of the cause of grief, discord, or strife. Ear all the leaves of, and that should be one, one tree. So this is the last one is sort of this combination again of refinement. Um, and and th th this is a, a sort of a, a, um, an interesting thing about you're not only not to sp speak ill of others or revile others or use foul language uh, or profanity or, or commit profane acts, but guard your eyes from unseemliness, which means uh, that you don't want to expose yourself to works that are, say, pornographic or, or suggest. In other words, you should be refined in every aspect of your life because every aspect of your life influences your spiritual progress. And then finally, and this uh, again is one of those that's responding to a law from another religion. It is not necessary to take journeys to visit the resting place of the dead. Uh, you can, it's not saying don't, it's just saying, it's don't feel that it is a, a, an obligation because for many people, of course, it is uh, very costly and in some cases uh, life-threatening for them to do so. A Republican form of government is best, but kingship, and this is what I was referring to, is also a sign of God. The combination of the two will bring about great reward. So he, if you remember in our study of his letter to Queen Victoria, compliments her on utilizing a parliamentary form of advisory uh, advisors, elected advisors in her government. Um, so he does not say the time for kingship is gone. He just simply says uh, that it should be combined if you have a form of monarchy or kingship. It should be combined with uh, parliamentary advisors. Um, now we come to the second in of the seven works we will look at. Ornaments, and these are all have such beautiful names, both in the original and the translation. Uh, and he has this uh, head note, that which hath dawned from the mother book. In other words, these are ornaments. These are some of the jewels, some of the uh, jewel-like utterances and laws that have been have come forth from the mother book, the Kitabi Agnes. Know thyself and what is the straight path in all matters. And having achieved that understanding, help educate others also discover the purpose for which they have been called into being. This know thyself is as old as Greek philosophy. It was the foremost axiom in Greek philosophy. And it has, it obviously, it means uh, this in a very deep sense. It did back then and it does in the Agdas. It means uh, know that your essential reality is your soul and that from that reality, all your other human powers uh, derive and that your soul continues after death. And so in other words, know why you were created and, uh, and do your best to educate others about these same principles so they'll know how to direct the course of their lives accordingly. We could discuss that and you know, make the whole class based on that very easily. Consort with people so here again, notice the, you'll see some rep repetitions throughout these. Consort with all people of with people of all religions with joy and radiance to promote concord, tolerance, and righteousness. So here he doesn't just uh, exhort us to do this; he tells us why, what it will, the result will be. So it's it's to, to promote concord, uh, and, and not simply to so that you can try to convert them to your religion, whatever. Uh, it's beautifully said. So in, in these cases, obviously, I'm quoting him when I can. 
Possess a good character that your light may guide others to the straight path. Be just and fair-minded. I don't think that needs any explanation or comment from me. Be trustworthy, for it is the greatest portal leading to tranquility and security of the people. And of course, there's an exercise, I believe, in Rui Book One about the importance of one single virtue like trustworthiness being implemented. What would be the result? It's a really good exercise <clears throat> to imagine if just that one virtue were exercised by the generality of humankind, how different your lives would be. Give expression to that which is right and true. Lauded is craftsmanship and the arts. Now, these seem to be diverse or two different things in one. Uh, but in other words, give expression through, well, at least my understanding, through craftsmanship and the arts. So he, he noticed the, uh, and this will be repeated several times, the uh, praise that Baha'u'llah gives to the arts and craftsmanship, uh, sort of a return to uh, um, the cultural milieu of uh, where the individual has uh, uh, pride in what he or she does in their vocation. Acquire knowledge. In this day, the secrets of the earth are laid bare. The news is spread abroad, but the press must be truthful, ascertain the facts. Again, these seem to be diverse things combined into one. But what he's talking about, of course, is that the world of sciences was even in his day uh, opening up whole new vistas of knowledge about the cosmos as well as the as quantum physics. Uh, and uh, he talks uh, at length in other places about the importance of the press. Uh, the, uh, and, and he gives example uh, of how uh, the press has talked against him uh, and, and against others and has, in effect, tried to destroy their teachings and so on. And so uh, he believes the press is important. And of course, even today, uh, not even today, especially today, trying to, the, the press is the source of, uh, of exacerbating the great division we have in our own nation. And finally, he concludes the ornaments. Following this is a long message to Babis and to Hadi. Now, Hadi is a Babi who later followed Mirza Yahya, and there's a very interesting narrative that, that is within this work. Uh, Hadi is also the one addressed in the latter part of the epistle to the son of the wolf. Uh, it's very interesting we had, when he addresses those who at the time are in the faith and doing well, but he foreknows they are going to, uh, uh, either they have or they, uh, he knows that they will uh, turn against him and against the faith. The next work, the effulgences, again, a beautiful word. This is, begins with a long narrative to Ali Akbar, who was the architect of the first Mashrikala's car in Ashgabat in modern day Turkmenistan in Russia, or what was Russia. It's very, a very touching uh, um, discussion. Uh, and he switches from Arabic to Persian uh, for the intended audience when he begins the effulgences proper. Um, obviously because the Babis are the main audience he is talking to with these new laws. Uh, of course, the first, uh, their pictures, if you're not familiar with them, you, you can simply Google Baha'i Houses of Worship and you will find a picture of pictures of that first Mashriq al Azkar, which was destroyed first. It was uh, uh, rendered structurally unsound by earthquake and then uh, the um, uh, rulers at the time uh, as a... Uh, uh, persecuting the Baha'is, had it torn down completely. A very remarkable design. Minarets and so forth. 
the knowledge of God and obedience to newly revealed laws, ordinances, and prohibition. And again, that this isn't a specific uh, law or exhortation. It is, he is praising the knowledge of God and obedience to the laws and ordinances and prohibitions in the Agna. So that's how he starts off, be obedient. Remain steadfast in the cause of God and obey him, regardless of whether they are suited to your expectations. This is something that you will find repeated throughout the Baha'i writings is a phrase, the verily he doeth whatsoever he willeth and ordaineth whatsoever he pleaseth. And it's uh, sometimes misunderstood to mean God is capricious and uh, is just going to do whatever the heck he wants. Obviously, that's not what it means. It means that sometimes the laws seem troubling or are inappropriate or uh, you're not sure what the purpose is. Well, once uh, the faith becomes your mizan, your standard by which you assess what is right and what is wrong, then you, you approach it differently and you say, this law seems screwy. You think, I wonder what it's trying to teach me. I wonder what I have uh, to learn from it uh, and wonder what the logic is behind it. Because every law of Baha'u'llah has a divine logic that in time becomes uh, apparent if you focus on it and you think of it in action and you experience it in action. So that's what this is staying, saying. If, even if you come up against a law that you find difficult, hard to maintain, uh, that's even contrary to the norms of your society and certainly uh, the laws of the Baha'i faith uh, and so far as uh, uh, chastity and alcohol and so forth are concerned are quite contrary to what is not only acceptable but encouraged by society. Arts, crafts, and sciences such as can profit the earth. Again, uh, I said that he emphasizes this, and here it is again, the arts and crafts and sciences, but uh, he says such as can profit rather than those studies he will say in various places that begin and end in words. I love that phrase because I think I took some classes at the university that began and ended in words. Most of them were philosophy courses, uh, but there were some others that I felt were just uh, a lot of words, but without much value to me. Uh, our awareness of and attentiveness to divinity, the Godhead and the like, attention to the peoples of the world regarding the new revelation as succeeding that of the Bob. Uh, this is not an exhortation. I mean, it is but I don't think it needs much explanation that we should be uh, aware of and attentive to the Godhead. What the, to, uh, even though God is essentially unknowable, what can we know about God and how does that shape our lives? Let me take a little of my tea. Words of paradise, isn't that beautiful? Um, so uh, the words of paradise uh, has various leaves of it. And the first leaf is about the import importance of the fear of God in protecting people, though a few have an inherent sense of what is seemly and moral. Now, th this is very interesting uh, in that there are, and maybe you've met in your life, some people who were simply, and you, you may attribute it to have, have they're having had good parents or whatever, but there are some, some uh, a handful of people that perhaps you have met in your life, or maybe only one or two, who were really sort of inherently good people and always tried to do and uh, continued to try to do the right thing. But he says, that's not true with most of us. Most of us need the twin pillars of education, which are reward and punishment which he also says are the twin pillars of justice, that order is maintained by this fear of punishment and this desire for reward. 
Uh, so what does the fear of God mean? Well, certainly we're not talking about the fear of God that is promulgated or propagated in the Old Testament, where you have this image of God as a jealous uh, ruler who uh, uh, is uh, uh, arbitrary in his actions and cruel in his punishment. No, it means the realization that your actions have consequences, both in this life and the continuation of your life in the life to come. We don't believe in hell or heaven, we do believe that you are always in a state of trying to become nearer to God or, as Baha'u'llah says, enter the presence of God. And entering the presence, he says, is accomplished by uh, studying the manifestations, emulating their character, and reading their writings and doing and following their laws. The second leaf concerns exhorting the rulers of the world to uphold religion as the greatest source of order and tranquility. The decline of religion causes the decline of order and the onset of chaos and confusion. Now notice he says religion, not uh, just the Baha'i faith, <clears throat> because religion in general exhorts people to be good. The religion which is fanatical or superstition uh, he, of course, it would not come under this category. So he's talking about, obviously, that religion which exhorts the unity and collaboration of the peoples. The third leaf of, per, of the words of paradise concerns exhorting the people to be concerned with justice and mercy and that which will profit mankind. Uh, the golden rule is really what he's talking about, and humility. And the golden rule in the Baha'i faith is even more exacting uh, than that of Christianity or Islam. Christianity says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Baha'u'llah takes it a step further and he says, don't even think about something you want to happen to someone that you wouldn't wish to happen to yourself. So don't even let it enter your mind, let alone act on, on such a, a feeling. The fourth leaf concerns the standard of justice for kings and others in power. For even as their favors can be great, so can their faults have grave consequences, like the execution of the Bob. And again, these aren't quoting from Baal. These are my summaries of these leaves. The fifth leaf concerns the exaltation of wisdom, man's unfailing protector. And again, learning, sciences, arts, so on, emphasize time and again. It is God's emissary and the revealer of his name, the omnipotent. So studying, whether it's studying the text or studying sciences or art, emphasize time and again. The sixth leaf concerns the importance of justice, the source of unity among men and the raiment whereby mankind can create the kingdom of God on earth. A just, a, a, it should be a just society. Seventh leaf concerns setting aside differences and estrangement, but cleave instead to the standard <clears throat> of unity, which will lead to the well being and tranquility of humankind. This is uh, something, of course, that Baha'is are challenged to exercise within their own families and within their own Baha'i communities. Uh, because while we are exhorted to have unity, <clears throat> In our society, we are uh, time and again uh, come up upon situations that cause disunity, whether it's divorce in a family or uh, one family or community against another, whether it's uh, racism or any other kind of uh, uh, cause of estrangement. <clears throat> Excuse me. The eighth leaf concerns teaching children the principles of religion, particularly the promise and the threat, reward and punishment, the twin pillars of justice, but in a gentle and loving manner so they will not become fanatics. Connected with this is the need to have the house of justice devise in time one language, one script for all the peoples so the earth can more easily achieve its destiny of becoming one land. So again, he doesn't use the term auxiliary language as he did in the other tablet. Here he says this will be eventually 
a single language. Nightleaf concerns various complex matters, but focuses on moderation, even in regard to creative inventions. And I put the atomic bomb in there uh, uh, just as an example. He talks about this uh, in detail in other places that, uh, that uh, even liberty when carried to an extreme, uh, it, when it transcends the bounds of moderation, can lead to license rather than uh, a positive outcome. And he foresees radiation release and the, uh, and the internet. Uh, this is one of the tablets where he alludes to, uh, there is a force in the earth, which if released will cause the poisonous, poisoning of the atmosphere. It seems fairly clear me, to me, or always has, that he's talking about radiation here, though it could be pollution in general. And he also alludes to at some point there will be uh, the ability to communicate from one end of the earth to another in lightning speed. Well, that's what we're doing right now on this internet. And uh, so that's come true. Uh, and he, um, uh, alludes to the irony that some followers have caused him more grief that, uh, than, <clears throat> that should be then, than imprisonment or enemies. And he alludes in particular to those who murdered Sayyid Muhammad of Isfahan. And that's the, the, what I was talking about, the seven individuals in Akka who did that. He says that caused him more grief than his enemies could. Tenth leaf regards the abolishment of asceticism and monasticism, we're repeating that one again, and encourages instead the enjoyment of the things of this world. So he takes a different approach here. He says that the things of this world are meant for your enjoyment, so enjoy them, and including uh, association with others as opposed to a monastic life or an ascetic life or being a hermit or a Sufi or uh, uh, those who practice uh, isolation and so on, uh, become a social being as you were intended to be. Now, that, again, that's my paraphrase, not, not his words, but that's the sense of it. Uh, and of course, one of the uh, bounties or enjoyments of this life is marriage and, and having children. The 11th leaf encourages the believers to remain constant, focused, to avoid being the cause of strife, but adhere firmly to the guidance Baha'u'llah has revealed, show forth love and affection, these revealed texts are conducive to the glory, advancement, and education of all the peoples of the earth. Uh, and then he has more. Uh, the rest is extremely interesting thoughts and sharing with Haidar Ali, the, the, uh, uh, um, oh, what, the angel of Carmel, and to Mirza Yahya, to the people of Tar, and to the people of the Bayan. And it's very touching. Uh, it's lengthy and, and, and quite, quite meaningful, but we don't have time to, to go through that. And again, remember this, <clears throat> the word, the phrase, the people of the Bayan, after he has revealed himself, uh, is referring to those Babis who have not recognized him or either who have turned against him. So it's usually a, a pejorative term uh, he's not condemning them uh, per se, but it means those of you who are still following the Bayan, even though the Bab explicitly told you in the Bayan that in the day of him whom God will make manifest, if you're following the Bayan, then you're not following me and you're not following the Bayan because in the Bayan, I'm telling you to follow him. So you see the irony and the power of that phrase. The splendors. Let me take some more tea before we uh, go to the splendor. <clears throat> the, the beginning of the splendors is really delightful, and it uh, it uh, uh, has this lengthy passage that is like a tablet unto itself, and I'm sure you've heard it many times. It is. Uh, 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 I give you the page numbers there. It appears both here and it's repeated an epistle to the son of the wolf. It's a, uh, and it uh, is, I don't know how you pronounce that, but um, Mubalek or something like that. 
uh, it, it means teacher or proclaimer, and it's a, a powerful passage. Ask rhetorically if certain prophecies have come to pass, and then each one to each one he responds that they have. And in short, this is an introduction that functions as a tablet unto itself with proofs. So have the as this has the trumpet sounded? Yes, the trumpet is sounded. Uh, you know, uh, and he repeats all of these prophecies that come from both uh, Islam and and other scriptures, and says, ha, ha, "Have this come? Yes, this has occurred." So, in other words, the, the it's a series of proofs that this is the day of days. First splendor concerns the regard for religion as a radiant light, an impregnable stronghold. So we're, uh, we've had that one before. The the, the religion. Is a, is a source of unity. The second splendor regards admonishing the peoples of the world to establish the lesser peace. We've seen this the second time we've seen that one. The third splendor is obedience to God's laws, and as much as reward and punishment are the two pillars upholding world order. So these twin pillars uphold education, they uphold justice, they uphold order. The fourth splendor consists of praiseworthy deeds and upright character, the commander of which is the fear of God. So we see the fear of God concept again. These will render this revelation victorious. The fifth splendor regards the necessity that governments acquaint themselves with those they govern and confer upon them positions according to desert uh, and merit. This seems to apply to those who are appointed to various positions of authority. That's my comment. Uh, so uh, it's uh, cautioning governments to be uh, wary of those that they put in positions of authority and to always have in mind that the purpose of government is to assist the peoples over whom they hold sway. The sixth splendor is unity that can be attained by creating a language and a script whereby all peoples can understand one another's writing and speech. This is what the third or fourth time we've seen that uh, repeated. The seventh splendor is the education of children. Well, this is the second time we've seen that one. A law incumbent upon the parent and the community. Now, this is very important because he goes on to say here, that if for some reason the parents cannot or are not educating the child, it is then the community's responsibility to take over and see that the child has an education, either for providing sufficient funds or seeing that uh, they uh, uh, take over, that, that they function uh, in loco parentes, that they uh, function in, in the place of the parent that the parent does not have the, work, the right to deprive the child of education. The eighth splendor concerns regard for the universal house of justice. And this is the second time we've seen that explicitly stated. The trustees of God among his servants for that which traineth the world is justice, which is upheld by two pillars, reward and punishment. Fifth time, I think we've seen that, which are uh, sources of life to the world be obedient to the house of justice, finally be the dawning place of love, defile not your tongues with cursing or reviling of any soul, and guard your eyes against that which is not seemly. That's the second time we've seen that. Uh, so uh, it's hard to do in this day and age, is it not? It's, it's hard to turn on a television and, uh, and guard your eyes from things that are not seemly. Uh, the ninth splendor is to remember that the purpose of religion is to establish unity amongst the people of the world. Therefore, do not let it become the cause of dissension and strife. And this applies to Baha'is as well as to any other religion, which tends to become chauvinistic. So as a Baha'i, if you think that you have the only path to God and that everyone else is condemned or something, you haven't understood what Baha'u'llah is telling you, that the religion should be a source of uh, of uh, uh, collaboration and friendship, not to say I have the best religion or this is the most important religion and so on. The conclusion of this particular uh, Nobic verse is lengthy and speaks of those who would oppose Baha'u'llah and the faith and speaks to individuals. Jalil and answers, 
and I'm not sure what that I messed up on that and answer specific questions regarding interest paid on loans and whether or not this is permissible or advisable. Uh, let me get some tea. We're almost through. I realize I've gone over the usual 45 minutes, but uh, that's a self-imposed restriction, so it doesn't bother me. Um, the uh, What he goes on to say is that, yes, it's okay to get interest on loaning people money. Uh, I don't know if he puts limits on that about usury or anything, but he, he does go on to say, yes, this is permissible. Words of wisdom. The source of all good is trust in God, submission unto his command and contentment with his holy will and pleasure. The essence of wisdom is the fear of God. Now notice these all follow the same phraseology, source of, essence of. So they're very succinct, but very powerful. The essence of wisdom is the fear of God, the dread of his scourge and punishment, and the apprehension of his justice and decree. We could spend a good hour or two discussing that one. Though I think we've mentioned it before, again, the fear of God, about the fifth time that's appeared. The essence of religion is to testify unto that which the Lord hath revealed and follow that which he hath ordained in his mighty book. The source of all glory is acceptance of whatsoever the Lord hath bestowed and contentment with that which God hath ordained. The essence of love is for man to turn his heart to the beloved one and sever himself from all but him and desire not save that which is the desire of the Lord. True remembrance is to make mention of the Lord, the all praise, and forget aught else beside him. True reliance is for the servant to pursue his profession and calling in this world, to hold fast unto the Lord, to seek naught but his grace, inasmuch as in his hands is the destiny of all his servants. The essence of detachment is for man to turn his face towards the courts of the Lord, to enter his presence, behold his countenance, and stand as witness before him. And again, we've discussed those before. This doesn't mean literally that you will enter the presence of God or behold his literal countenance. This is done by uh, studying and become a nearness and entering his presence is attained by uh, attending to the guidance of the manifestation and studying the manifestation. The essence of understanding is to testify to one's poverty and submit to the will of the Lord, the sovereign, the gracious, the all-powerful. And that sort of paraphrases what Baha'is called the noonday prayer, that our purpose is to know and to worship God and to do whatsoever he commands of us. The source of courage and power is the promotion of the word of God and steadfastness in his love. The essence of charity is for the servant to recount the blessings of his Lord and to render thanks unto him at all times and under all conditions. The essence of faith, and this is a lovely one, <clears throat> very much like a hidden word which says essentially the same thing. The essence of faith is fewness of words and abundance of deeds. He whose words exceed his deeds know verily his death is better than his life. That's a scary one. The essence of true safety is to observe silence, to look at the end of things, and to renounce the world. Now, to look at the end of the things means what the ultimate goal of your life is, and to follow and to govern your life accordingly. The beginning of magnanimity is when man expendeth his wealth on himself, on his family, and on the poor among his brethren in his faith. The essence of wealth is love for me, who so loveth me is the possessor of all things, and he that loveth me not is indeed of the poor and needy. This is that which the finger of glory and splendor hath revealed. The source of all evil is for man to turn away from his Lord and set his heart on things ungodly. The most burning fire is to question the signs of God to dispute idly that which he hath revealed, to deny him and carry oneself proudly before him. The source of all learning is the knowledge of God, exalted be his glory, and this cannot be attained save through the knowledge of his divine manifestation. The essence of abasement 
is to pass out from under the shadow of the merciful and seek the shelter of the evil one. Notice that's in capital, and that's because it's personified. And of course, it doesn't mean uh, this is a being, but the evil one, of course, is the self, is turning towards the self. The source of error is to disbelieve in the one true God, rely upon all else but him, and flee from his decree. True loss is for him whose days have been spent in utter ignorance of himself. Again, this goes back to one of the first ones we said about knowing thyself. The essence of all that we have revealed for thee is justice, is for man to free himself from idle fancy and imitation, discern with the eye of oneness his glorious handiwork, and look into all things with a searching eye. Thus have we instructed thee, manifested unto thee words of wisdom, that thou mayest be thankful unto thy, the Lord thy God, and glory therein amongst all peoples. <laughs>